Go ahead. Okay. Jeremy just showed us how cross-site scripting in general works. And once again, this is another case of where we have an application that has been given what it thinks is data information, but it actually executes it as code. Now, he went through some examples as to how this works in the background and how you can go in and craft your own uh, exploits and slip them in there and make these things pop up. But for perhaps the vast majority of us who are not as smart and talented as Jeremy is, we might need some help getting this done. Well, fortunately, there is yet another tool, open source tool, that is readily available called Beef. And it's a wonderful cross-site scripting exploitation tool. Uh, Beef does come with your backtrack. By default, it does not come with the Kali distribution. You have to install it. I think it is available in your, uh, in your Samurai. And if you go out there and look for it, the, um, the, the, the aptitude depository or whatever they call those things is uh, Beef-XSS. X S S. So have to get install B dash X S S if you want to get that. Uh, it is primarily a, a tool for doing penetration testing. It's not terribly useful for doing vulnerability assessments because you need to have the vulnerability there and identify, and then you can go in and take advantage of it with Beef. And what it does is it will take your browser and it will actually get what they call it's called hooked into a beef server that's running on the machine that you control. And it has this, I don't profess to understand all the nuts and bolts behind this, but there is a beacon that goes back between the beef server that you control and, and the user's browser between the two of them. Usually you will use a cross-site scripting trick or some SQL injection on the vulnerable application to get that call, that initial call to your B server set up. But once that once, you know, they only have to click on it once. Once that's done, you know, you're, you're good as long as that uh, browser session is running. Okay, so what I have here is, um, well, as we see, we have uh, Internet Explorer here, and I've got it running uh, I'm going to point it to Mutiladay running on the virtual machine on the, on the Apache server that, that we have running here. And then I've also got, when we go back to the virtual machine, hopefully the colors are a little bit easier to read now except the sun's coming down and washing it out a little bit more. I've cranked up the, uh, the beef server here and uh, it's, it's running, it's, it's running away here and you can see that it will give you the uh, URLs that you need to use to contact to it. By default, it goes on a port 3000, and it even comes with a handy little uh, JavaScript, you know, pre-written JavaScript hook uh, that you can <coughs> use to put in your cross-site scripting vulnerability. And then it's even got a, a, a graphical uh, interface. So the next thing I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and find my cursor and we will crank up said graphical interface. Let's see if I still have it here under my most visited. User control panel. There we go. That's what I want. bet we're probably going to have yeah, another color problem here, but uh, in this particular case you don't really need to see. Okay, so I got logged in and I get this nice friendly feature here. Over on the left hand pane what we're going to have here is a list of browsers that are currently hooked in and then here we have the offline ones. Those are the ones that are not currently hooked in. That's left over for some testing I did earlier. And then you get the nice um, steer and information on B 
speak and things of that nature, but it's pretty much just sitting here waiting for something to happen. So what I'm going to do is, if we go back to our vulnerable application utility here, and we'll um, we will look for there we go for a cursor once again. We've logged in here, and we're going to go to a page that I happen to know is um, uh, vulnerable for cross-site scripting. Get it right here. It's the good old add to your blog page. At least as long as the security level is set at zero, this is susceptible to cross-site scripting. And the reason it's susceptible to cross-site scripting is because it allows you to put data into this text box and save it to the database. And when these data are then, you know, retrieved and redisplayed back out onto the screen, they are not encoded as Jeremy said they should be. They are going to be executed. And what we're going to put in there is going to be something very simple that looks like this. Beef. All right, let's see if we can zoom in on that a little bit. We've got a, a script tag and it gives the source of the script um, that might look familiar. That was prompted to us back when we started up Beef. It said, hey, you know, here's a uh, sample uh, hooking script that you can use. So, okay, we say, all right, we're, we're gonna use that and identify it as JavaScript. And then we're just going to um, save that blog entry. Now this page what it does is it saves it to the database, and it also uh, displays the blog entry back here at the bottom of the page. Now, as you can see, all that shows up here is the word beef. The rest of it doesn't show up. The, the script tag doesn't show up because it was not encoded as data, so it didn't get treated as data. It got treated as executable code, and if everything is working as I hope, when we go back to our machine, we will see that we have a new hooked browser. Yay! And it says, uh, you know, it's Internet Explorer, Windows 7, blah, 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 gives you what you need to know there. We'll come back over to here. There it is on the hooked browsers list. We'll highlight that. Right off the bat, um, it's already gone out there and collected a bunch of information about that browser, you know, j just by default, figuring that's, you know, some of the stuff uh, you're going to want to see. Now, I will tell you that in the last year or so, the browser manufacturers, I mean, what do, you, what do you call these people who make our browsers? I don't know. But the, uh, the major browser players have been putting some more security features into their browsers um, to at least kind of warn the users that something may be going on when a, uh, one of these tools comes across. Um, in particular, Beef uses uh, <laughs> often uses Java to get this work done. So 
on the other end if the browser is set up for warnings in case you know Java starts to come across the user may get a you know bar that they have to click on or a little warning that says you know Java you know needs to go ahead and run but that's usually not a problem because you know, you get these little things pop up on your browsers. Says, do you want to run this? You know, well, you're trying to get someplace. Of course, you want it to run. You know, everybody, come, everybody's going to click yes on it. It's usually not too much of an issue. But I will, I will caution you that that's uh, that is starting to show up more and more. So we've got a lot of uh, information here on, on the details tab. Um, some stuff about the particular page that they're looking at, including uh, you know all the all the cookies. There's the uh, you know, user ID and username that you know, we were playing with earlier, so now you know, you've got them right here. You know, make that handy for you. And also built in is a commands tab here within Beef. And this is where we get uh, this is where we get a lot of the great stuff that's just put together for us. Uh, what Beef does is it looks at that detail information based on the particular browser and operating system that is being hooked to, and it's, I don't know, it's got hundreds of possibilities out there, and it goes through there and determines which ones are likely, you know, to be able to work in this particular situation. So we can look at um, a number of these things. I'll um, Go ahead. We'll just start out here with the social engineering because this was similar to what we saw Jeremy do just a minute ago. Now, in addition to listing these things, for those of you uh, who are not colorblind as I am, they, they tell me that you can actually determine how likely a given exploit is to run in a given situation by, by the color of these dots. For those of you who that works, you know, I'm jealous. Uh, I, I actually have to click on them and, and see what happens. In case you're wondering why you see so much green, or why I monochrome so many of these things. Uh, okay, so we're going to go down here to something similar, and we're going to click on this pretty theft. And let's see, we still have a problem with the. Uh, Colors, but we'll highlight that there. And this is going to be doing a thing uh, like Jeremy just showed us, except it's going to be you know point and hack for you. So we're going to pick the uh, we're going to pick the Facebook type of log on, and we're just uh, going to say execute. And what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and it's going to through this beacon send some information back over to that other browser. back to the browser and at this point ah okay well here's a bit of what Jeremy was talking about it kind of got stuck down here in the corner not necessarily the most impressive place to put it but it does indicate that our Facebook session has timed out and to put in um, your email password ID. You can also insert your own uh, custom logo on here if you happen to know something that's going to help it make a little more um, believable to the, to the hooked person. suffering from one of those messages or something. Well, in every demo, there's going to be something that didn't work quite the way it did the night before. I might try to go to the view box page. 
So because you, you left the uh, so you left that cross site script like a little bomb when you're waiting, right? Just waiting for someone to come to the site and visit. And when they visit the page, they're gonna get the hook.js file delivered to their browser, which is gonna open up that command and control back to your server there. Yeah. So I'm wondering if maybe the on the ad blog add to your blog page if there's some kind of weird like circular stuff going on. Yes, the F5 is probably a good key at this point. Um, yeah, it's always one of these things that, you know, dang it, this worked last night. That's the so if you go to uh, view blocks, um, link there right above the title, or right below that bar here. Yeah, it, it did do the connection because we see that over here on the left side of the um, of the beef. We can see that the, the Yeah, it definitely did that. It's I'm like it had trouble with that ad page. Yeah, it, it and it sent it over there, but it just wouldn't come back. Let let's try a um, well the, okay, just just another reason why sometimes it's better, as Jeremy showed, to you know have your own uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, different browsers. Different browsers do different things. Try, Let's try going back to Mozilla Day and then clicking on that <coughs> drop-down box that has, um, which where it's, it's lets you pick who you want to view. And that's what you want to view. Yeah. Okay. And I think you put that under the Conrad user. So in yeah. that drop-down box there, yeah, you drop down. Or you can say show all. It's the very top. So, oh, yeah, that works. Okay, so that should okay, that, provide a fresh hook for you. Yeah, that, that should resend it back over here and for our hook. So let, let, let's try a different one, <laughs> just to cover myself here. We're going to um, do the old, uh, this is going to be another social engineering, similar to what we saw a minute ago. And we'll look here in the log. And it says, okay, this has been sent over to the other browser on the other machine. And yeah, we're not getting a. Uh, touched something in between. All right. I want to try to send like the JavaScript alert box or something that's easier for the browser to handle. Maybe that'll help. Let's go back up here. Let's try this one. We have a um, sends an alert dialog to the hook to browser. Okay, went over there. We got the ready coming back. Ah, and indeed, we did get the alert dialog. Uh, Again, this is kind of a case of where Jeremy says that somebody might look at that and say, well, you know, so what? We got an alert dialogue. But what really means is that we were able to asynchronously execute, you know, the JavaScript necessary on that particular browser, you know, to get that to run. I mean, the user didn't have to click on anything. They were just, they were just sitting, you know, after they did the initial hook click, then they just, they were just sitting there. We were able to, you know, kick that off remotely. 
where that really comes into play um, is when we can do some of these other things. For example, we can go, we can suck down, you know, the entire HTML of the page. We can go in and replace the hrefs on that page while the person is working on it so that when they click on something, um, now it will redirect them off to where we want them to go after we've seen the page. You know, that could be our own copy of this particular application, at which point, because we know what the application looks like, because we've been able to uh, duplicate the pages all along to get the page HTML while they were going through it, so we suck all those down, we build our own, you know, uh, doppelganger of the website, change what we want, and, you know, we can just start harvesting information, you know, right and left. If you've got, um, if you're really lucky, th this is, again, this is a, uh, this is getting harder and harder than it was a, a year ago. Uh, it does have um, the ability to, I, I don't have it installed on this machine, but it does have the ability to integrate with Metasploit so that you could use some of these shells and things that um, you know, Adrian was showing us earlier. You know, if, if there's the, the Metasploit exploit for the particular environment that you have hooked in, so you can pick those things up. Uh, we also have the ability, let's see here, get registry keys. I believe that, you know, that's if you've got Internet Explorer and they've got um, unsafe ActiveX controls turned on on the other side. You don't see, again, that happens most often if you've got a particular environment where you still have some of the XP machines and you still have some applications that they haven't yet gotten off of IE6, where they've got some Internet Explorer 6 specific code and they haven't got that off there yet. In those kinds of places, a lot of times they'll just have to have that uh, allow the unsafe ActiveX set as the default on everyone's browser, whether or not they're using one of those IE6 applications. In which case, you can get in here, you can pull out registry keys through their, through their Internet Explorer, and also um, execute raw JavaScript in there. Sometimes, again, if you can use the ActiveX controls, you can also call the uh, file system object if they're using Internet Explorer on Windows, which will allow you to then, you know, just directly read files off of uh, either off their hard drive, or you can go ahead and actually map network drives and then just read uh, things out of. Uh, anything that they have, that particular user has access to. And again, this is all happening behind, behind the scenes. If, if the user were really, really observant, you know, they might notice the little, the, the flicker, uh, the little, or down there at the very bottom of the, um, of the browser window. But for the most part, um, it, this works really well. Once you can get them to do that, that first initial click to get that, to get that hook in there, then you've got them. Now the drawback is that once that particular uh, browser session goes away, then you know your hook goes away, and you're, you're not going to have them anymore. There are some things to help you get around that. There is a persistence here that will create a new pop under window with the beef hook already there. So that uh, you know that can help keep that hook <coughs> connected back to your beef controller. It can be a little um, obvious, you know, if, if they do happen to see that, then they might, you know, you got to be careful who you use some of these things on. You need to try and target people who uh, 
don't ask a lot of questions sometimes on some, on some of these things. Okay, mitigations. Well, uh, don't have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in your application. Don't have SQL injection vulnerabilities in your application. And where the SQL injection comes in, of course, is that you, you use it to inject the script into the database so that later when that record is called back up, it gets, it gets executed. Uh, and also, when the browser gives you a warning that maybe what it's about to execute might not be completely safe, there may be a really good reason why the browser is telling you that what it's about to execute might not be completely safe. And so some user training um, could be in order to just not automatically click yes on all those types of messages that come up. So that's beef. A uh, really handy uh, point and click tool. Uh, went over some of the basics here, like I say, to if you really want to get into it, see how it integrates in with Metasploit so that you could you know, hook in browsers and there use the use them much more powerful exploits from there. Questions on, on beef? As we see, here's where it uh, executed the instructions on the alert dialog. Just a comment on the uh, pop-up here. I know some of the <coughs> new version that the pop under window has its uh, coordinates set, so it actually goes off the side of the monitor and it's off in like un, uh, non visual space. Ah. So that one was pretty neat. Good, good. Okay. I had, I had not noticed that yet. I thought it wasn't working until I realized that just I could see the slightest sliver of the edge of the window sitting. You know, right along the right hand side of the monitor. Yeah, let's uh, see. If we have a couple minutes, let's see if we can see that here again. Probably all didn't hear that, but I, I did hear the little noise on on my uh, card here suggesting that yes, indeed, that uh, pop under. Oh, uh, blocked it. Uh, I got pop ups blocked. Okay. Uh, okay, that's what the little beep was. All right. So, like I say, it's coming harder all the time because you know. If we uh, <coughs> did allow that, uh, and then oh, uh, I think you, you can hit retry. And then you get another one. So I, I think the pop under is behind there. It's like if you kind of move your pop browser down a little bit. Or... Let's, <laughs> let's see. Uh, yeah. Oh. Just, just a brief digression. <clears throat> I have found that when you're doing cross-site scripting, if you need to divert the user's attention for a few moments while something quickly runs in the background, oh, sure. get a cute puppy. <laughs> Bill, I mean, you, you know, you could have a headless torso roll across the screen, and they won't notice it because they will be looking at that <laughs> cute puppy. Um, pig in boots is even better. I'm sorry. Pig in boots. Pig, pig in boots. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Some, some, something to do the, the misdirection. Always. You haven't seen the pig in boots. Yeah, I'm not sure if we're...
Well, Jeremy, it appears you're right. It's still there someplace. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know where. But I, I, I don't know where. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Oh, well, no. No. Did it lose it finally? Yeah, yeah, it slipped off. It slipped yeah. off. Okay. It was behind for a moment. Yeah. Sometimes that's all it takes, just a moment to grab what you want to grab. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's beef. Handy too. Yeah.